We're back. We're live. We're here on Memorial Day here on Research in Manoa. We're talking about SOAS, the School of Ocean, Earth, Science, and Technology, and its component part, the uh, HIGP, Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, uh, with Andrea Gabrielli, who is, joins us today even on a holiday. Happy Memorial Day, Andrea. Happy Memorial Day, Jay. <laughs> nice to be here. <laughs> nice to have you here. Thanks for having me here. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, Andrea is a research assistant, a PhD candidate at HIGP, the Hawaii Institute of uh, Geophysics and Planetology in UH Manoa, and kindly joins us, comes down so kind to come on down on, on a Memorial Day when the air conditioning is not exactly working <laughs> in the building. <laughs> it's very hot. <laughs> dedicated to your science, I know. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> So um, before we began, uh, uh, Andre imparted to me that he was from Italy. I told him I could have guessed that. <laughs> <laughs> my funny accent or? <laughs> no, it was your my, name. My name. <laughs> <laughs> A combination of things. <laughs> so tell us, you were born and raised in Italy. What part of Italy? Um, Milan, which is in the um, northern part of Italy. Yes. Uh, so I studied there. Um, I studied physics at the University of Milan. And my, um, uh, my project, my bachelor degree, was about seismology. So we were studying uh, um, earthquakes uh, and processing uh, um, seismic noise um, and volcanic tremor by using uh, you know, different spectral analysis tools. And then uh, I've always been uh, you know, interested in, uh, in volcanoes and in the earth well, science. Well, Italy has a certain history in volcanoes and seismic activity. Will you talk about that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mount, uh, um, uh, even with uh, some of the ancient uh, Roman philosophers, such as Seneca, they were, uh, they were able to link uh, volcanic gases as the main, um, the main fuel for volcanic eruptions, even, even with, with philosopher Seneca and even later with Mercalli and other uh, volcanologists, because um, that's, where, that's where actually um, volcanology was born, with the studies of eruptions of Etna, like the Monte Rossi eruption in 1669. So the, the, this kind of, these were the very, very first, uh, um, you know, uh, publications about volcanoes and, and gases. Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm sure there were fatalities, yeah? Oh, yeah. Vesuvius comes to mind. Vesuvius, uh, Vesuvius was, thought, was thought to be um, a mountain at the time uh, Pompeii and Herculaneum were destroyed. Yes. So that, that, that's a pretty, that, that, that it's famous, the description um, of Plinius uh, uh, describing the eruption. That, that was actually one of the very first uh, um, descriptions that we have in history of an eruption. So I mean, this is very interesting to me. I hadn't thought of it before, but um, so Italy has a history of volcanic activity, uh, eruptions, uh, seismic activity. Um, so therefore, when you go to school and you stay here in high school, you know about this. And so it's a real, mm, it's a real interesting area to cover because at least academically in the country of Italy, um, people know about these things and they think about these things. Maybe they worry about it happening again even. Yeah? Oh yeah, I remember for example, um, we have um, like, uh, it's a small uh, vacation house down on the Adriatic Sea on the eastern coast of Italy. And near near uh, 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 mm, mm, Venice. Uh, Venice is in the north. That's in the central part. Okay. So it's near Ancona and everything. Okay. Uh, Ancona. Um, but there, I remember, it was summer, and there was an earthquake. Uh, it small earthquakes, but everybody was, you know, uh, awakened by the earthquakes and everything. And uh, I remember going to the, to the beach and talking to the people about the earthquakes. And people, since they knew that, you know, I was studying these things, they were asking me questions about it. So <laughs> <laughs> sometimes we have even a um, conversation of earthquakes that, uh, you know, like that and everything. Um, but it, it's also, I think, similar to, to Hawaii. You know, when people study the volcano here, uh, they have the heritage, you know, because of the, they know that volcanoes are here, that the islands are made of, from volcanic eruptions. And so the, even here, I think, 
Um, well, so when so you told me before that uh, after school in, uh, in Italy, you took a Bachelor of Science degree, I guess, in Milan. Yes. And then you went to England. And then, well, why England? And what did you study in England? <laughs> there aren't many volcanoes in England. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, England. Uh, so uh, since my background was in physics, uh, now in Italy, what happens is that volcanology is very related to geology. So I didn't have a degree in geology. So this is why in England, they, uh, um, the University of Lancaster, which is in Lancashire, in, uh, um, in the very, it's very famous, it's a nice city there, um, over the Irish Sea. And it's very famous because they investigate uh, uh, volcanoes from a physical point of view. So they apply physics uh, to volcanoes. And this is why... You wanted that. And this is why I joined uh, um, Professor Lionel Wilson, who uh, also comes to Hawaii uh, every year. He's a visiting professor at UH as well. Uh -huh. And so this is why I joined him. And we stu started to study magma chamber um, dynamics, so how the stresses uh, uh, induced by magma being injected into the, the, the plumbing system of volcanoes affect the dynamics and how th this was modeling to try and predict, uh, try and model the offset, the, the, the beginning of a volcanic eruption. Uh -huh. So that's, uh, so, that, uh, so this was the work in England with Lionel. But what, what was really funny was that uh, we actually went back to Italy to study Etna on a field trip. You and uh, Wilson. <laughs> uh, no, I and, and uh, another volcanologist, uh, um, we went uh, down to, um, to Etna to study the, the volcano. It was a field trip, you know, and so this, this was very funny, you know, because in England there are many volcanoes, so we had to go. <laughs> 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 Mike James, Professor Mike James, uh -huh. yeah, we went there with him. That's great. So uh, <laughs> you, found, you found that there was a lot to study that uh, in, in Italy from whence you left already. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, but isn't it true that, uh, you know, that, that volcanism, is that the right term, Vol that mm -hmm. the study of volcanoes uh, is not everywhere. And you have to find active volcanoes, you have to find, you know, volcanic structures. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and seismic activity uh, to make it worthwhile to do the study. So it's not everywhere. And there are a lot of places in the world where it doesn't happen, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, one of the advantages of Hawaii is that it, it's very convenient. Uh, it's safe. You can go to Kilauea. Um, for example, once we went there to study the, ga vol uh, the emissions from the lava lake on the summit, um, we had some battery issues with the instruments. We ran out of battery. So what happened was that we could easily drive back to Hilo and get, you know, a new battery, for example. So this is one of the, one of the advantages. Uh, Hawaii is very convenient, you know, to, for these kind of yeah, studies yeah. and everything. Yeah, that's the same thing with the telescopes, too. Oh, yeah. Just drive down the hill, you have a, it, a city pretty much right, right <laughs> at your doorstep. <laughs> yeah. So, so okay, so uh, what degree did you take at Lancaster? Uh, master in Volcanology and Geological Hazards. Okay, and then you left there and there was a message. The message was, come to Hawaii. We got plenty of volcano. I mean, how did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, basically, my uh, background, my bachelor was in physics. And then if you think about it, my... Is it true that the study of physics makes you smarter than most individuals? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> we should ask some. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, physics, uh, uh, and then um, in Lancaster, um, it was basically a geology program uh, in which we were applying physical laws. So trying to put together these two things. Here, at the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, Professor Robert Wright was uh, um, looking for, you know, a, a researcher, PhD, to try to basically to test new technologies, to test how new technologies and new instruments could be effectively used to study volcanic gases. 
And so this is why it was sort of combining uh, my master, my bachelor, you know, and, and, and uh, in, into this uh, a new um, work, which is, which is exciting, you know, because testing new technologies on an active volcanoes and... Uh, but, but you were always destined to come to Hawaii. I mean, every volcanologist has to come here, right? Isn't this, <laughs> this is Mecca, isn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but there is a funny story. Uh, when, I, when, I, when I firstly came here, because, you know, I was trying to, uh, you know, meet new people at the beginning and everything. And so I remember I met this guy and uh, he, he was asking me, what do you study? What do you do? And everything. And, uh, and I wasn't very specific in my answer. I said, I study Kilauea, meaning the volcano. I, I was meaning the volcano. But probably, again, you know, he, he actually thought I was talking about killer whales. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, you, you can imagine, you know, so this is why today we're stressing that we're talking about volcanoes because yeah, yeah. last time, uh, you know, this was very, you can imagine how the conversation went. <laughs> he was like, oh, you, this is, sounds very interesting, but also uh, dangerous, quite dangerous. How can you? And you know, again, I was thinking Kilauea being, uh, you know, a relatively safe volcano. So I said, no, you know, it's only, uh, it's not very dangerous. I said to him, I said, it's only if you climb it. <laughs> and you get too close, <laughs> then it, but again, he was thinking of a whale, so his face was just like, you know, his face was just, how is that possible? He said, it's so slippery, how can you climb it? <laughs> he ultimately figured it out, though, eh? He ultimately, <laughs> yeah, I, I was like, wait a minute. Climbing? How come it's so? It's not slippery. What are you talking? About? So then we figured that out. But it was very funny. <laughs> you know, uh, the, the benefit here on this show, you know, with uh, Andrea uh, Gabrielli, uh, research in Manoa, is that we knew from the outset that it wasn't had nothing to do with whales or killer whales. That it, we knew at the outset it was Kilauea. So we're way ahead of the game. We're going to take Good. a short break. We're going to get into the meat of it. We're going to see some photographs. This will be really interesting to find out what he does in Kilauea. Hello, I'm Crystal from Quok Talk. I've got a new show here. You've got to tune in. Check out my topics on sensitive, provocative female issues. So Tuesday mornings, 10 o'clock. Don't miss it. It's going to be fun and dangerous. Hello, I'm Stephen Katz, and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap, which comes to you live every Tuesday at 3 p.m. on thinktechhawaii.com, and then it's repeated again whenever you want if you go to the website. On our show, we will be talking to all different kinds of therapists, psychologists, psychoanalysts, psychiatrists, people who talk about the mind, the brain, and about different ways to find happiness. Um, I myself am a marriage and family therapist in practice here in Hawaii, and I hope you will join us because I've got a lot to learn, you've got a lot to learn, and it's a great ride. Thanks a lot. See you soon. Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, and I'm fortunate to be able to host Sustainable Hawaii at thinktechhawaii.com. I hope you'll join in with us every Tuesday from 12 noon to 1 p.m. to see the interesting people we have to share with you their information. Aloha. We're back. We're live with Andrea Gabrielli. We're doing research in Manoa with uh, HIGP, the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. And he is a PhD candidate and research assistant there. And what we're talking about, actually, uh, not whales, <laughs> but volcanic gases. We're talking about measuring them. We're talking about thermal infrared hyperspectral imaging spec spectrometers. And that's what brought him to Hawaii, because he had heard that we have instruments here that measure all this stuff in volcanic uh, activity, so he had to see for himself. So, <clears throat> you came here, what, two years ago, mm -hmm. and been working in these hy hy hydrospectral imaging spectrometers, spectrometers, what's it been like? And show us some pictures. Oh, um, very, uh, it's very exciting at the same time also challenging because, uh, 
you know, volcanic gases are uh, very important when dealing with understanding whether new magma has been injected into the volcanic plumbing system, whether it's rising and whether eruptions are imminent. So um, they convey lots of information um, about uh, uh, magma movements and dynamics at, 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 uh, it, within the magma chambers of volcano. And, um, and we, if we can maybe have the... the yeah, we're going to have some pictures now. There's some. So why don't you describe what we're looking at? So since we started with Italy, this is a, um, a picture I took on the summit of Stromboli Volcano um, in Italy. It looks pretty active to me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, it, it was called uh, back during the Roman Empire... It was called the lighthouse of the Mediterranean. <laughs> really? Because uh, this volcano is, is famous for having these uh, um, explosions every 15, 20, 30, 40 minutes. So it was, it was used by the navigators for, with, with, uh, you know, to try and uh, find their way to Rome or to, the, to other places in the Mediterranean. And uh, this is an explosion. You can see the clots of basalts being blasted out uh, up to 600 feet into the air. So the top of the throw on that, uh, on that photograph, the pieces that are highest up would be 600 feet it, yeah. up above the, uh, of the flame. Yeah, yeah. This, was a, this was a pretty big explosion. Usually yeah. they are smaller. This is why we went there to study this um, activity because it was um, higher. The, the explosions were bigger than, than, than usual. So, but what's interesting is that um, you can see um, to the left of the explosion there is a, a reddish cloud. That's basically the volcanic, the, the gases that the plume, the volcanic plume that was released during the explosion and is, is being carried away by the wind. Now, that, that's the part you're interested in, eh? That's the part we're interested in because they can tell us lots of information about them. Um, these explosions. So, um, to try and predict, to try and make both short and long-term volcanic eruption predictions, uh, it's important to study, you know, uh, these gases, uh, and especially gases measurements as well as uh, the formation data, the formation of the edifice. Uh, um, so this is why, this is the first reason why we are interested in studying and measuring these gases, because they can uh, help us, uh, they can further our understanding of eruptions, how they happen, when they happen, is it possible to predict them? So you looking at this, this plume for uh, its uh, chemical makeup, mm -hmm. uh, the timing, uh, the, the burst of it, I mean the size of it, uh, yes. every characteristic you can think of and, and then you put them all in a model somehow and th they will tell you what's going on, what did you call it, in the plumbing down below. Well, uh, volcanologists, um, uh, they, they, they measure these gases because they're interested in, uh, in trying and understand if these uh, uh, values deviate from the normal, the background levels. Um, for example, Kilauea volcano, um, I, I think I have a picture um, of the Kilauea, it's the second, um, yeah, this is a picture of Kilauea volcano. Now you can see um, this plume being released by the summit caldera is uh, composed mostly of water vapor, carbon dioxide, and sulfur dioxide. Uh, now sulfur dioxide is very easy um, to detect in the atmosphere because there is not a lot of SO2 in the atmosphere. So it also smells terrible. Uh, that, 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 that's high, it, it, it's, it's uh, poisonous, but the, <laughs> um, there is another gas that has the, the famous uh, rotten egg smell, that's yeah. hydrogen sulfide. Oh, it's, hydrogen sulfide. It's, okay. it's, another, it's another gas. This one's more dangerous, though. Sulfur dioxide is, uh, is dangerous. Uh, uh, and, that's, and, this is, and this brings us also to the second reason why we are interested in studying these plumes. Because if you look at this picture, these gases are, are, brought, are carried by the wind towards, uh, uh, you know, downwind regions. So, for example, if you think of the Big Island, Pahoa, or the Kona Coast, these gases can threaten uh, people, animals, plants, uh, infrastructures, uh, 
downwind the, the vent. So that's the they don't, but they don't blow away at the same altitude. They go, they go down the hill. They conform to the to the volcanic uh, uh, slope going down. In in Hawaii, in in Hawaii, um, this is what happens because. Uh, um, the gas, it, basically the gas is released by the summit and then carried away by the wind. But sometimes in other um, locations where, where the, for example, uh, the Cascades or other more explosive volcanisms, uh, the, these gases can even be injected into the stratosphere. So if, if the explosion, if the blast, if the initial blast is very strong, they can be even uh, sent into the stratosphere. Um, and that's another effect. That, that doesn't uh, threaten the people directly. It can affect the weather, the global mm. weather pattern. Ah. Um, for example, uh, there, is a very, there, there is a funny story. Uh, there is a volcano in Indonesia um, uh, on the... Uh, island of Lombok called uh, uh, Gunung Tambora, and Tambora explode. It, it's one of the most uh, um, uh, powerful eruptions, uh, uh, one of the most historical power, uh, powerful eruptions, and uh, it affected the climate uh, on the whole planet. In fact, the year after the eruption, it, it, we're talking about 18 uh, in, in the uh, 17th century. What happened, it, it's called the year without summer. I think it's 1816, the year without summer. And back in Europe, um, it was raining. It was a very cold uh, um, summer. And the funny story is that Mary Shelley, you know, she's a famous writer. She's the one who uh, wrote the novel of Frankenstein. <laughs> so because of the weather, they couldn't really enjoy the beautiful summer, I, I think they were um, somewhere in Switzerland, and they couldn't enjoy the weather. So they decided to have like a novel um, writing competition. That's how she wrote Frankenstein. <laughs> in a competition. <laughs> in a sort of, with, with other, um, with other uh, poets like uh, Percy B.C. Shelley. Yeah, and, any uh, relation? Yeah. And, and so they, this is how Frankenstein was sort of, you know, was born because of the eruptions of uh, Gunung Tambora. <laughs> <laughs> so they can also affect the, the, the so climate. Yeah. If the gases go high in the stratosphere, they can move anywhere in the world. Is that it? They can move anywhere in the world. In fact, uh, uh, again, uh, after this um, eruption of Tambora, um, what happened was that they were, uh, you know, volcanic gases, and especially these gases and ash into the atmosphere, they can uh, affect this, um, the, um, you know, sun. So basically the sunsets are very reddish, very red because of the, the presence of these particles in the atmosphere. So they were having these, uh, uh, in England they were calling bloody sunsets. Really? Uh, bec uh, because, of the, because of this volcano in Indonesia. And England's going to be eight or 9,000 miles away. Yeah. The other side of the universe, really. Yeah, yeah, but compared to Indonesia. Yeah, yeah. But even more recent, uh, um, in, um, in the Philippines, uh, 1991, the eruption of Pinatubo volcano, uh, they, uh, you know, the, the, again, they were having these effects on the, on the, on the atmosphere. They were, they, it, it, could be seen even from England or other places back in Europe, um, and uh, so very, very they can spread because of the winds in the stratosphere. Now the first picture you showed us, uh, the one in Italy, was at night, mm -hmm. and you can see the you know the flames of of the eruption. The second picture you showed us was in uh, Kilauea, I guess, mm -hmm. and that's uh, just a looks like a cloud. But if I took that picture at night, the one at Kilauea. What would the color be? Would I see it at all, or would it just be a sort of a dark spot on, on the sky? Well, you would see the glow from the lava lake. Below the cloud. Below the cloud. Reflecting up. Reflected by the... So if you go, for example, to the Jagger Museum at night, uh, you, can actually, you don't really directly see the lava unless it's, the lava lake is very, very high within the, within the vent. Uh, so what you see is the glow, 
the red glow from, from, uh, from the, the lava lake. And speaking of that, I think I have uh, um, another picture. Uh, I think it's the, the third one. Yeah, this is exactly, uh, this is exactly what we're talking about. This is how this, uh, uh, this is a long exposure picture mm. um, at sunset. Uh, you, you can see the Milky Way behind it and the, um, the lava lake and the glow we were mentioning uh, um, uh, reflected by, by the plume. And I remember it was sort of, uh, the weather up there is sort of, you know, uh, can be very quick, changing, very, very rapid. Yeah. So I remember while I was taking this picture, um, it was raining, I had to run <laughs> to <laughs> cover the camera and everything. So these are, you know, the, uh, the challenging field work yeah. and everything. The joys of science. The eh? joys <laughs> in the field. <laughs> Let's see some more pictures. Um, so here, this is the instrument um, we are using to study um, gases. Now this is a this is a thermal hyperspectral imaging device. What does that mean, hyperspectral? Spectral, I guess, means the spectrum of light that, that is reflected by certain elements on the periodic table. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, we measure, uh, this, this instrument can look in the, in the thermal infrared. So in the electromagnetic part of the spectrum is basically between um, 8 and 14 microns. And we measure features. We measure the spectrum. We measure the shape of this uh, uh, of the spectrum. And then, if there is gas between the background, for example, and the camera, the instrument uh, in uh, in, uh, in these pictures, for example, then we can see uh, differences in the in the spectral in the spectral features. So we measure these features, and based on the height or the depth, the absorption of the emissions of these uh, features, we can retrieve the uh, concentration of these gases. And so basically, we're talking about um, um, path concentration. So how ma what is the concentration of gas along this path, along the viewing path? And a good thing about this is that uh, it's, uh, infrared works at night. So the pictures, oh. uh, there are different instruments that are already uh, being used at volcanoes, um, but they are, some, uh, they are based on ultraviolet. It's another part of the spectrum. So it's ultraviolet radiation, which is, unfortunately, is not available at night. So the, the good thing about this instrument is that it works at night. And if, if you see uh, the picture on the right, uh, we were um, on the roof of the HIG building back at UH Manoa, <laughs> you can see Waikiki in the background. Yeah, yeah. What we were doing is that we were basically um, testing this instrument on measuring uh, other gases. So not only volcanic gases, but this particular study, we were trying to measure the ozone, the presence of ozone both in the troposphere and in the stratosphere. So with this device, you can measure gases anywhere. We can measure gases anywhere, and particularly we are, we are, we are studying how to measure volcanic gases. But again, uh, it can be used for any real, really any gas that um, have a feature within the thermal infrared, the region of the electromagnetic spectrum. And of course, the, the, these features have to be sufficiently sufficiently large to be seen by the signal to noise ratio of the instrument so basically uh, sufficiently high to be detected mm. and uh, with this instrument that means you have to have a, a, enough gas a, out there in, a, in, in, in order to be distinctive to to the, the measurement mm -hmm. in other words if it's too far or too thin you won't see it this is why um, so we tested the, um, this is how, this is why we also um, uh, tested the instrument in the lab by using uh, gas cells. So we filled, uh, we filled these gas cells with a known concentration of gas and then, so, and then basically to determine. You're testing, you're testing. Yeah. Testing to determine 
um, how, um, what's the minimum concentration that, that we can detect. So that's exactly yeah. what you were saying. So we made experiments to characterize uh, the instrument in, in the lab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I feel that, uh, you know, at this point I have a little gas, and so we're going to take a short break. Okay. <laughs> Aloha, everybody. My name is Mark Shklov. I'd like you to join me for my program, Law Across the Sea, on thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha. You're watching ThinkTech on thinktechhawaii.com, which broadcasts five live talk shows from noon to 5 p.m. every weekday, and then streams our earlier shows all night long. Great content for Hawaii from ThinkTech. Aloha. How you doing? Welcome to Ibaji Talk. Gorgo the Techs are here. We're here every Friday from 1 o'clock till about 1.45, and we talk tech with many, many great guests. I got uh, Andrew, the security guy, who helps me co-host, and I got Poppy Chulo, who comes in once in a while to, to help us through the show. So please come join Hibachi Talk every Friday. Angus will be here, too. So remember, like we say at the end of every show, how you doing? I feel so much better after that break. Here we <laughs> Research in Manoa with uh, Andrea Gabrelli, Gabrielli, and he's a uh, PhD uh, candidate research assistant at HIGP, the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, which is at SOAS, the School of Ocean, Earth, Science, and Technology at UH Manoa, and we study them every single Monday at 1 o'clock. So today we're talking about measuring volcanic gases. We're talking about using instruments, namely thermal, uh, infrared, hyperspectral imaging spectrometers to measure gas. And we had a tweet, you know, Andrea, during the break. Uh well, the answer is yes. Pinat Mount Pinatubo is still an active volcano. Now, the, now it's a dormant volcano, which means uh, the eruption occurred uh, back in 1991. Uh, it created a, a, a huge caldera, which I think is now filled with a nice lake. Um, but uh, people can uh, can hike and see. But oh, really? r right now it's a uh, it's a dormant uh, it's a dormant you volcano. Can, you can hike there safely. Uh, I've never been there, but I show <laughs> I, I I saw pictures okay. of that. It's a it's a I I uh, you know. I, I have friends from the Philippines, and they, they you know, sometimes they show me these nice pictures from yeah. there. Um, yeah, it's a dormant volcano, just as, uh, for example, uh, ma uh, lots of volcanoes in the Cascades, um, Rainier, or Mount Hood, or Lassen Peak, or Vesuvius in Italy. Yeah. We were talking about it um, earlier. How about Krakatoa? Oh, Krakatoa, uh, that's another interesting... Um, um, uh, I think um, the, uh, August the 24th uh, in the 17th century, that was uh, um, 1883, it was a massive blast and basically three quarters of the main island were destroyed. And that was a, that was a very, um, th that's in Indonesia, but the interesting thing about that was that the blast was heard even from Madagascar. Oh. That's 5,000 miles away. <laughs> 5,000 miles away. That was a very big blast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. The, the, what happened with Krakatoa was that the, the, the eruption started with minor explosions. And what happened was that the magma chamber was basically going to be emptied by these explosions. And so it collapsed. So there is, uh, with Krakatoa, there is a, a very big um, uh, inflow of water from the ocean that got into the magma chamber. So this created a massive, it's called, they call it um, phreatomagmatic uh, eruption. So the, the uh, interaction between lava and, and the, which is very hot in the ocean, it created massive blast. And so the entire island was destroyed. But then uh, a couple of years ago, uh, a new volcano started to rise from the ocean again, which is... The same area. The same area. And they call it, uh, in, in Indonesia, they call it Anak Krakatau, 
which means the son of Krakatau. <laughs> <laughs> Anak is a son in, in Indonesian, so that, uh, that, that was a big blast. Well, what I get from this is that, you know, the Earth is a living, breathing um, organism, you know, which changes. And there's all this heat inside and all that liquid magma under the, what do you call that, outside, uh, uh, mm -hmm. down inside. And, um, and it, it, it pops up through volcanic uh, eruptions. Uh, and uh, we, it has its favorite places of popping up. But I suppose uh, even when they get dormant, they can pop up again. Uh, and, and even when we have not had um, a volcanic eruption in a given place, that could happen again, either slowly or maybe quickly. And so what you're doing, uh, I guess, is derived, is, is directed um, at learning when they're going to pop up, uh, when we're going to have another eruption and the size and scope and danger of that eruption. All right, tell me what, you, what, what, what comes out of your science. What is the lesson for humankind? Well, as you were saying, trying to predict when these eruptions will be and the volcanic, speaking again of Pinatubo, the uh, um, gases measurements helped volcanologists to tell that an eruption there was going to happen. So measurements were collected with the, the correlation spectrometer or COSPEC, which again is a UV ultraviolet based. As opposed to infrared, as opposed, different than what you use. Yes, but that, that was back in the, the 1991. Your, your uh, machinery, your equipment is more advanced than that. that, that that's infrared. It has other uh, advantages. But even, even with UV, they were able to infer that Pinatubo was going to erupt after 400 years of dormancy. And this was, uh, uh, with the gases, was basically, I think, two weeks earlier than uh, they started to when they, then when they started to measure earthquakes and, and uh, seismological um, seismological activity so, how, so how, do you, how can you tell so okay I know there's been seismo seism seismological activity I know that that's a separate indicator yeah? mm -hmm. uh, now I look at the gases and I see in the what do I see in the gases uh, that makes me afraid makes me believe that there's going to be another eruption soon in case of gases like carbon dioxide, you can see an increase in the release of, from the, you know, the background atmosphere, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And then what you see is an increase in the, in the volcanic region of uh, more gases being released by, 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 um, by the volcano. But in case of other gases like uh, sulfur dioxide, for example, you can see, uh, you, you can actually detect it because there is not a lot of SO2 uh, in the atmosphere. And so you can, you can detect the gas. Uh, you can, if you see SO2, there is a very big chance that that's related to um, volcanic activity. So, so it's the changes that make the difference. So that means if you're looking for changes, looking for a dynamic, you know, to make your prediction, that means you have to measure at intervals all along the way. You have to always be measuring, am I right? Change, yes, yes, absolutely. Changes in fluxes, changes in the emission rates of, of volcanic gases, this all uh, is important when, when, uh, when trying to predict uh, um, these eruptions. And this is why we are, so the goal for this particular project is to test uh, this new technology, which uh, has images capabilities. So for example, if you, f if, you think, if you think of a plume, you have a synoptic view, you can measure the whole plume, and you can accurately estimate fluxes from volcanoes. And you get a picture. And you get a picture. And, uh, and also, um, and also um, the, um, and also at night, again, as I said, with, with the infrared, uh, so the goal is to test these instruments now on the ground and then uh, try to fly these instruments uh, over the volcano oh. to try and make measurements from oh, airplanes. Oh, that's a whole new dimension, isn't it's it? It's a whole new dimension. And right now, we, um, um, particularly Robert Wright, uh, 
um, at the University of Hawaii is developing a, a new instrument uh, which has even a pathway to space. Because if we could, could put these devices in space, then you could basically um, measure gases from remotely from space, it would be very efficient. You monitor the whole Earth that way. Yeah. Now, for example, here you can see a picture of our instrument when we brought it to the, to the Big Island to field test it. So now you can see uh, we brought it, uh, we are scanning uh, across the plume at Kilauea. And I think uh, uh, I also uh, brought, uh, yeah, this, this picture here, yeah, this one. This one is an infrared, it's one of the first uh, infrared hyperspectral images of a volcanic plume. Now this basically, it's a, it's a particular picture, it's a, it's, a, it's a spectral image. So what you're looking at in yellow is where the SO2 gas is. You, you may, you, it's an artificial color though. It's an artificial color and blue in this case was the background. So basically there is a color bar which is telling me here there is SO2, here there is not SO2. And what we're doing is we are developing a, a retrieval algorithms to process images like this and retrieve from images like this and retrieve path concentration of SO2, in this case of sulfur dioxide gas, which can be converted into flux estimates, which is what volcanologists need for their studies and, uh, and predictions and predictions so here's my 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 last area of inquiry with you uh, uh andrea um andrea so we have we have uh measurements uh we can tell what's in that plume uh we can tell the size and shape and force of it we can look down from satellites, maybe even look down from drones. I bet you, you're thinking about that too. Yeah. Um, and we're going to be able to, uh, you know, know a lot about the plume, and we are able to make predictions of what volcanic activity and maybe big time Richter scale volcanic activity too. Um, is this something that we need to protect humanity uh, to save lives? I mean, why, if I live in Japan where they have plenty of seismic activity? Uh, why do I care? Why do I care about this science? Well, uh, pred predicting volcanic eruptions. If you think, for example, as you mentioned Japan, there is a volcano, Mount Sakurajima. Is, they call it the Vesuvius of the East. It's surrounded, <laughs> it's surrounded by lots of, uh, uh, lots of cities and towns and villages. It's a very populated area. So you can see, uh, trying to predict the, um, uh, when an eruption will occur, not only hours or days in advance, but even weeks. Ah, or so even, I save so lives. It, it, it can help for, um, and, and another reason, again, is that these gases can threaten people living down, if, if you think of Hawaii, again, you can think of the Kona coast, which is severely affected by the VOG, the, the volcanic smog, or even sometimes it gets up to Oahu as well if the trade winds are not blowing. And uh, I remember when I was, uh, um, uh, I, I, I was called, uh, I was uh, invited to be a judge at the st uh, S State of Hawaii Science Fair. I was ah, amazed. Oh. I was just amazed by all the, the quality uh, of the works that were presented uh, by the passion of the, of, the, of the kids that they were, they were uh, there. And I remember talking to this kid, uh, he was studying the VOG as well, and he told me uh, that he, he, he was born on a big island, and when he was a kid, the, when, he was, uh, when he was there, when he was on the big island, he was suffering a lot because of the VOG. He had breathing, breathing problems. And so he told me, I really want... Uh, uh, any, I, I really don't want anybody else to suffer like I did while I was on the Vega Island. <laughs> so this is another reason why we care, uh, you know, to, to try and help the, the, the people uh, that have the, to deal with, with and here in Hawaii, again, you know, it's Thank very, you, Andrea. Uh, That's a really a wonderful <laughs> story. And Andrea Gabrielli, a researcher in Manoa, uh, having to do with measuring volcanic gases at uh, HIGP in SOAS at UH Manoa. Thank you so much, Andrea. Thank you, Jay. Thank Aloha. you. Thank you.